Welcome to Atlanta, Georgia, one of the fastest growing, most glamorous, and popular cities in America today. If you've ever been here, you know that it's a vibrant city with new apartments and condos being built everywhere you look. However, Atlanta was not always this way. In fact, in the 1980s, it had a truly awful reputation. Violence, third world poverty, and overall dysfunction were the overarching themes of the city. It was considered just another poor southern city like New Orleans, Memphis, or Baton Rouge. <laughs> But then in the 1990s, it began to take a turn for the better. With companies like UPS, Chick-fil-A, and Home Depot moving to the area, thousands of jobs became available. And as a result, thousands of people began moving to Atlanta from all over the country. Los Angeles, Detroit, New York, and most importantly, Chicago were the biggest cities for net migration. But because Atlanta proper had such a bad reputation, many of the families settled in the surrounding suburbs. They sold their small houses in Compton or Chicago and were able to buy big two-story homes in the Atlanta metro. Obviously, this is a great thing, but it wasn't perfect for everyone. As many of these families improved their environment, sadly, some of their young sons kept the mentality from back home. For example, if you were a rolling 60 back in LA, you were now a rolling 60 in the Atlanta suburbs. Oh, six, so good. But instead of claiming a certain territory, membership was spread all over the metro area. I use the 60s as an example, but this applies to pretty much any gang in America. You name one, and they probably moved to Atlanta during the 1990s and 2000s. And in this video, we focus on one of the largest and most dangerous in all of America. This would be the Gangster Disciples, also known as the GDs. If you're unfamiliar, the Gangster Disciples were started by David Barksdale and Larry Hoover in Chicago in 1968. They were designed to resemble the Italian Mafia and especially in the way they're structured. I mean, they literally copied the Mafia bar for bar. Man, we can't have nothing. Well, in case you didn't know. Let me explain how they're structured. The GDs are led by a national leader who they call the chairman. The chairman oversees everything across America and calls shots when he has to. But as they expanded, one man could no longer oversee everything, and that's when they implemented regional leaders. So each region has their own leader who they call the governor. The governor oversees his state and makes decisions for all of his members. But he doesn't do this alone. In fact, he has two very important people by his side. First, you have the treasurer, the man responsible for collecting debts from his local members and forking it up to the national leaders. Then you have the chief enforcer, the man responsible for keeping members in line and making sure they're sticking to the codes. So just like the mafia, when a member is out of line, the chief enforcer puts a green light on their head and the other members are forced to pounce. This right here is a very important part of the story as the chief enforcer can put a green light on literally anyone he wants. So if he asks you to make him a sandwich and you don't, you're out of here. So long story short, the chief enforcer is the man you do not want to piss off. Well, now that you understand the structure, let me introduce you to the governor for the state of Georgia. When the gangster disciples arrived in Georgia, they chose a very reputed member to become the governor. This would be a man named Alonzo Walton, also known as Spike G. Alonzo was raised in the rough streets of Southside Chicago, particularly the corner of 72nd and Stoney. There, he became known as a reputed GD who was known for putting in work. He was him! Somehow though, he made it out of the streets alive and moved to Georgia in 2004. At 34 years old, most people would want to leave the streets behind, but not Alonzo Walton. He continued to live the life of a gangster disciple, even in his new city of Atlanta. And after holding it down for a few years, the national chairman chose him as the governor for the state of Georgia. You are the governor. Well, after earning this title, he went out and recruited a bunch of new members. And by 2008, they were over 50 deep in the metro area. The gangster disciples were here. Now you may laugh when I say this, but it's the truth. Alonzo Walton, Walton and the, and the GDs, GDs had, no, had intentions no intentions of ever, of ever hurting, hurting anyone. anyone. Yes, you rolled your eyes, but in this case, it might actually be true. Most of these members were originally from Chicago, so they didn't see these Atlanta suburbs as anything threatening. Instead, their mission was to stay low-key and run up millions with all of their brothers. So for three years, the GDs ran it up in every single illicit way you can imagine. This included swiping, moving weight, and last resort was hitting licks. Give me that! Then after members would get their money, they would run it back to Alonzo's safe house in South Atlanta. This is where the GD members met up, discussed business, and laid low when things got hot. 
Well, everything went smoothly for the first few years as no members were arrested and there were definitely no violent encounters. But then one bad incident would unfortunately kick everything off. And that takes us to Marietta, Georgia, a suburb located about 20 minutes northwest of Atlanta proper. As many of you already know, this is a very quiet place where nothing ever happens. However, at this time, it was home to three very grimy gangster disciples. First, you have 28-year-old Alfonso J. Rock Watkins, originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Then you have 24-year-old Harvey Rooks Hogans, a native of Brooklyn, New York. And lastly, you have 29-year-old Derek Kemp, a local of Marietta, Georgia, who graduated from Florida A&M University. Well, for whatever reason, during their adult life, they all decided to join together as Atlanta Gangster Disciples. In the summer of 2011, the trio decided to make their first move. Derek, J-Rock, and Rux were off to the races. This is when they met a plug named Derek Gray, a 22-year-old local from Marietta. Derek was your typical suburban plug. He operated alone, he stayed low-key, and he stacked whatever money he could. He had recently married in the spring, and this was sort of his side hustle to his main 9 to 5. His wife was actually pregnant, and that's why he figured why not collect some extra cash. So essentially, when Derek met the GDs, he figured it was a good opportunity to level up. So he texted them back and forth for a couple days until they all came up with a plan. And that takes us to July 2nd, 2011. The day finally comes for Derek and the GDs to make their deal. So at 7 p.m., Derek meets them in an empty parking lot in Smyrna, Georgia. At this time, this is a remote area surrounded by forest, and that's why the GDs strategically chose it. Well, when Derek arrives, the GDs tell him to get in the back of their Ford Taurus with his bags. He's slightly suspicious, but he goes along with it anyway. So he hops in the back seat and instantly Rux snatches his bag. Derek realizes what's happening and he immediately goes to grab it back. But that's when the GDs make a terrible decision. Bang. They realize what they just did and they quickly drive off with Derek still in the car. They head down Circle 75 Parkway and that's where Derek is sadly left. The disciples then speed down Highway 285 to get out of Cobb County. They continue for 30 minutes until they reach Union City and that's when they call a fellow member to come pick them up. When the member comes, they set the car on fire and they all drive away. By all accounts, Derek was just a good man who was doing what he could to support his wife and his future child. It just so happened that he ran into the wrong group of guys. Well, this was the very first tragedy caused by the GDs in the Atlanta area. And after the incident, the governor Alonzo Walton was not too thrilled. With where they did this, the tragic ending and the burning car, it was all too much for Alonzo's liking. And due to this, he conferred with the national chairman about the state of Georgia having a chief enforcer. The disciples were growing fast and Alonzo could not afford another risky incident like this. Members needed to fear making terrible mistakes. That was the bottom line. Well, the chairman agreed and that's when Alonzo Alonzo appointed a chief enforcer for the state of Georgia. This would be a man named Donald Glass, also known as Smurf, a local GD from the small city of Lithonia, Georgia. Smurf was known as a dangerous member, the kind of guy who would do anything for the GDs. And once he became the enforcer, he went out and created his own enforcement crew. This would be known as the Hate Committee, and their sole purpose was to discipline members who were out of line. So if an Atlanta GD member was out of line, Smurf would send the Hate Committee his way. You better run. But for whatever reason, Smurf was not the only chief enforcer in Atlanta. The other would be a man named Kevin Clayton, also known as OG KK. KK was a local rapper in Atlanta and he was heavily connected in the industry. Like when rappers came to Atlanta, KK was the man to check in with. He wasn't really the type to extort you, but instead he just wanted to form some mutual respect. Well, together, Smurf and KK grew the committee to over 20 members in the first year. They recruited both existing GDs and non-affiliates who were able to get put on. Smurf and KK wanted the committee to be extremely feared in Atlanta, and early on, they were looking for any reason to prove it. Essentially, they had no ops or fellow members to discipline. They were bored and ready for action. And during the summer of 2012, Kevin Clayton came up with the perfect idea. After hearing Rick Ross's hit song called BMF, Kevin Clayton felt disrespected. In the song, Rick Ross says, I think I'm Big Meech, Larry Hoover, Whip It Work. 
Hallelujah. Now you may be wondering what could be disrespectful about this, but KK had his reason. He thought it was uncalled for to use the GD founder Larry Hoover's name without getting permission from the GDs. I mean, <sighs> bro, we have a First Amendment, what are we talking about? Well, regardless of how I feel, KK reacted very harshly to Ricky Rose. On October 29th, 2012, KK released a video on YouTube threatening Rick Ross and telling him he's banned from Georgia. This straight at Rick Ross, the whole Maybach music is real talk. Look, first of all, let me get straight. Larry Hoover don't have nothing to do with this, so for y'all take the tape back and try to put LJ and his dad in it, they don't have nothing to do with this right here. It's like man. this right here. Man, we pulling up music. on you, we pressing up on you the whole Maybach. Fuck don't matter, music. It don't matter Maybach. who in Maybach, everybody on your label is in trouble. Did he vote? Whatever city, whatever state. Pressure. Hey, press your own. So like promoters, you know. we letting your promoters know. Before you book Rick Ross, y'all need to talk to us, G. GD vote! GD vote! It ain't going down. Pressure. You see what I'm saying? Amen. You see that right here? This just a, this ain't even a penny of the pressure. Oh. We ain't gonna leave, release this pressure off the after to you. Release this check. Period. You period. The Come check, we gotta pay the check, man. And watch this. It's just not a level. When we drop this on the YouTube world star, you gonna see a whole following of this shit, Rick. And get your lyrics Maybach, up. Maybach, Meek Mills, everybody, G. Nothing personal, but tell your boss, man, he gotta get that check, boy, cause y'all in trouble. GD Funk, GD Funk. The video went absolutely viral in the hip hop world and Rick Ross had no choice but to respond. During this time, Rose happened to be on tour for his new album, God Forgives I Don't. On top of this, the whole MMG was the biggest thing going in rap. You had Meek Mill emerging as a star, Wale emerging as a top artist, and French Montana dropping back-to-back -back hit songs. I say that to show that this was a very big tour, selling out multiple stadiums in every city across America. Well, coincidentally, just weeks after KK's video, Rick Ross announced that the rest of the MMG tour was cancelled. <sighs> That's mighty suspicious. This included tour dates in North Carolina as well, whose GDs released a similar video to KK. Well, as soon as the news broke that he cancelled the tour, everyone assumed that he was terrified of the GDs. So the boss was forced to respond to the rumors. <laughs> On December 10th, 2012, Rick Ross addressed everything on a radio station interview. I canceled the rest of the tour due to um, um, the promoter wasn't really handling his business, you know what I'm saying? Okay. He canceled a, a date of mine. I was going to Tucson, Arizona. Okay. And I was really a few hours outside of the, the market when I realized- Of that Arizona? It, uh, Tucson. Tucson? Okay. I want to say, I believe it was Tucson. This was maybe a week and a half ago. And, I, you know, I just made a call to uh, the, the dude, Sean G, and just let him know that ain't how we move. Let's just communicate a little better. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the other day I woke up and realized two more dates had been canceled. So I just felt like there was some power that I needed to take away from homie. So I canceled the rest of the dates. Mm -hmm. And never was it due to any threats. You know, I'm a, I'm a certified man. I am a real boss. And this is something that everybody needs to understand. Gangsters move in silence. Mm -hmm. Gangsters move in silence. And in situations like that, I just remember some uh, uh, old school Dade County gangster told me a long time ago that any dude could stand in the crowd with 30, 40 dudes and everybody real. Everybody trill, everybody about that life, everybody gangster. You understand? But when the choppers come out, everybody fold. But more importantly, anybody that understand anything about GDs, because this is what it's supposed to be about. Anybody that understand anything about GDs, it's all about growth and development. Anybody that know anything about the old man, Mr. Hoover, that's why I put him in my song, because I respect his scriptures, his philosophies. Mm -hmm. It's all about support. It's all about coming up. It's just not about somebody who, you know, one sucker or, or somebody that got a, a, a personal vendetta. And that's something that we gonna address, you understand? But mm -hmm. other than that, that, that's not the case. I was just in Chicago a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. That's the birthplace of the GDs. And if I go to Chicago to handle my business like I did, I have no problem going to North Carolina or right. South Carolina where right. the ladies are brown skin, brown eyes, they got nice curls and they make the best apple pie. So don't ever get it twisted. Ricky Rose is a boss. I'm certified worldwide. I could put a thousand gangsters in any hood. I could put a thousand gangsters in any hood. Ooh wee. Huh? 
But that ain't what I'm here for. I'm here to make stars. I'm here to make icons. I'm here to break records. I'm here to be Grammy nominated. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing. So, and to me, rich is gangster. Loyal is gangster. You understand? Family is gangster. If that's not gangster, I don't want to be gangster. I'm a boss. I went from nothing to being a $50 million man. So don't never get it twisted. Sean G wasn't handling his business. You and can't that's cancel. You can't cancel a Ricky Rose show without Ricky Rose permission, and that's what he did with Tucson. Y'all get on the internet. Get on the internet. My show was canceled. I didn't like the way it moved, so I went to Vegas for two days. If anybody got inst Instagram, get on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. You'll see me getting a massage on one of those Instagrams. I was in the Palms, out in Vegas. I made the best of the night. You understand? But that's why the shows were canceled. And if I go to Chicago, I just want to say that again, I go anywhere. So don't get it twisted. And when you pull up the footage of me walking out in Chicago on the stage with the chinchilla dragging on the floor, you let me know if that's the swagger of somebody that's in fear of their life. And you holler back at Ricky Rose. And furthermore, um, I want to say that I salute Mr. Larry Hoover. So if you scream and cut a check, we need a check. Mm. Ain't no checks getting cut. Ain't never no checks getting cut. Well, I, don't, I don't play those games. Okay. I consider that extortion. We don't play like that. This day Dade County. Rosé stood on his 10 toes and made sure to defend his reputation like a man. But what do you guys think? Did he cancel the tour because of the GDs or was it just a coincidence? But before you comment, this next incident may shape your decision. January 27th, 2013. It's Ricky Rosé's 37th birthday and he heads out to Brickle, Miami to celebrate. After a joyous night, he heads home in his Rolls Royce with a woman named Shataria. At 4.42 a.m., he's driving in Fort Lauderdale to his beachfront mansion. As he's slowly driving down the street, a car pulls up right beside him. The car then rolls down their window and bang! Ross instantly punches the gas down Las Olas Boulevard. After making some distance between the car, he pulls a sharp right onto 15th Avenue. That's when he loses control of the Rolls Royce and crashes into a nearby apartment building. And we're following a news alert right now out of Fort Lauderdale, a car going into a building. Adriana Hopkins is live in Fort Lauderdale with more. Adriana? We're live here at Southeast 4th Street and 15th Avenue in Fort Lauderdale, as you mentioned. I want to show you again that Rolls Royce that crashed into this building. We're being told by people here on the scene, specifically the manager of the Floridian Restaurant, a popular restaurant here in Fort Lauderdale, that a famous rapper was riding in that car when someone opened fire at that car, that car crashing into that building. Police cleaning up the shell casing markings that were here just a few moments ago. This is still under investigation. We're told that famous rapper still in that restaurant this morning. On the bright side, both Rick Ross and Chateria were both okay. Regardless, this was a scary incident for the Teflon Don and Fort Lauderdale police were concerned. They approached Ross for details, but he refused to make any statements on the incident. For this reason, it's never been solved and no one knows what it was about. Was it the gangster disciples making a point? Was it local Miami beef? Or was it just a random attack? Because of the coincidental timing, a lot of people online figured that it was the gangster disciples. And this right here may confirm the rumor. In a 2016 testimony, an Atlanta GD named Markel White made some mind-blowing statements. He told the courts that after this incident, Rick Ross agreed to pay the GDs $6 million to get off his trail. But he clarified that the final payment was $3 million from Rick Ross to the Atlanta GDs. He never clarified who exactly got the money, but I think we can imagine who it was. But none of this means that it was necessarily true, as no one else has ever stated this. So what do you guys think? Did Rick Ross cough up $3 million, or is Markel White full of shit? Whether it's true or not, the Atlanta GDs were becoming very dangerous, and especially the hate committee. I kid you not, from this moment on, they would wreak absolute havoc in the streets of Georgia. For you talking about twin, this shit about to get crazy. Everything started on February 16th, 2013. OG KK is feeling like the man in the streets after going viral. Uh -huh. And on this day, he's shooting a music video in one of Atlanta's most dangerous hoods. This would be the Shell Station on Hollowell Parkway, which is known as the Bluff. While he's outside with Smurf and committee members Shantae Craig and Lewis Mobley. While they're recording the video, a man in a red jacket jumps in front of the camera. 
He taunts the disciples and repeatedly yells black. This means blood love all the time, but the GDs were not feeling the love. Ooh. In fact, OG KK is pissed and he looks over at Lewis Mobley to control the threat. So Lewis Mobley allegedly whips out in front of everyone and bang. The man whose name is Jermaine Higgins was rushed to Grady Hospital where he would be okay. Jermaine was an alleged Bloods member who had no idea who he was messing with. In fact, after the incident, he was pissed because he thought that it was all supposed to be a joke. And in classic Atlanta fashion, he told police everything that happened. So hate committee member Lewis Mobley would be arrested quickly after the incident. In the end, Lewis Mobley was sentenced to life in prison. However, he's only 88 signatures away from... I don't know. During this time, Atlanta was getting really, really bad. And incidents like this were a product of people from different gangs across the country all moving to the city at once. As we know, the gangster disciples had no intentions of starting beef, but they were now full-fledged against the Atlanta Bloods. It's beef. Still though, their main focus was stacking money and commanding respect. Hey, hey twin, you better respect me in these streets, you feel me? Man, I love Atlanta. Well, as we know, the governor Alonzo Walton was not a fan of beef. Instead, he only cared about making money. Specifically, he was a specialist in finessing insurance money. Oh my God. Get ready for this story. Alonzo Walton had a female friend named Mildred Frederick. And in December of 2013, she called Alonzo and told him that she blew up her engine by not putting oil in it. So Alonzo volunteered to check out the car and see if he can fix it. When he took a look at the car, he realized that the engine was completely burnt out. Alonzo saw this as the perfect opportunity to come up. He instantly told Mildred to lend him the car and follow his instructions. Hey baby, just lend me the car and I'll get you the money for it. Don't even worry about it. So Alonzo allegedly towed the car to a remote location and completely destroyed it. Up in flames it went. He then called Mildred and told her to report the car stolen to Atlanta police. He told her that within the next month, the insurance would pay her money to buy a new one. Now you may be wondering why Alonzo would do this, but it was all a part of a plan. According to police, all of the insurance money ended up in Alonzo's pockets. Wow. So now Mildred was out of a car and the money to buy a new one. This is how the Atlanta GDs were operating. Any opportunity to collect some cash, they were on it. They were in there like swimwear. The worst part about it was that their schemes were pretty intricate and they were very hard to trace. However, their biggest mistake was wiring all the money to their personal bank accounts. This would eventually get them wrapped up, but we're not quite there yet. In the meantime, the GDs felt untouchable and were doing whatever they wanted. Now we fast forward to March of 2014. At this time, OG, KK, and Smurf are still furious about the incident at the gas station. Even though they handled it, they still felt like no GD should ever be disrespected. And in their minds, more needed to be done to send the message. Atlanta, we ain't going for nothing. For you time out. So this is when committee member James Hightower was ordered to go on a mission. But instead of driving around looking for them, he decided to text them on social media instead. Specifically, he slid in the DMs of an alleged Bloods member named Anthony Bowers. Anthony has no idea that James is a GD and he figures that it's strictly for business. So after texting, they decide to meet up the next day and for James to purchase some items. March 22nd, 2014. Anthony's at home hanging out with his best friend Demetrius and his girlfriend Maisha. At 11.15, he gets a text from James asking to meet up in College Park and handle business. So Anthony instantly gets up and tells Demetrius and Maisha that he'll be back in 30 minutes. Hey, actually, do you mind if we come with you and you drop us off at home after? Of course, Anthony agrees and the couple go with him. Alright, let's rock out. At 11.30, Anthony arrives in College Park and backs into James' driveway. Once James gets the text, he exits the abandoned house and walks up to the driver's side window. For whatever reason, Anthony's window won't roll down, so Demetrius rolls down his in the back seat. He then notices that James is clutching on a blower and he tells Anthony to speed off. So Anthony hits the gas and that's when James sadly whips out. Sadly, Anthony wouldn't make it and Demetrius was paralyzed after surgery. The craziest part is that directly after doing this, James casually walked to a local park. The park is located only a couple blocks away from the incident and that's where he hung out for the next few hours. Why he did this, I don't know, but Maisha gave police his exact description. She also told them that he took off on foot and that's when they increased patrols. 
Fulton County sheriffs began patrolling the area looking for anyone who matches the description, and at 1 a.m. they discover James casually sitting on a park bench. I guess he wasn't expecting to see police because as soon as he saw them, he took off on foot. He ran through a nearby apartment complex and threw his phone and blower into the bushes. He then decided to lay down behind the complex and wait for officers to find him. At 1.20, police found him, put him in handcuffs, and asked Maisha to identify him. She did so, and just like that, James was cooked. The gangster disciples and Bloods were now full force beefing in the streets of Atlanta. And in the fall of 2014, things would get even more complicated. The late fall in Atlanta is truly a magical time. The leaves turn orange, everyone dresses up nice, and the vibe is something that I can't describe. But for GDs nationwide, it's also a joyous time for another reason. November 30th happens to be Larry Hoover's birthday, a day celebrated by all the GDs. In Atlanta, the GDs celebrate by meeting up at the Deja Vu Sports Lounge. This happens to be located on Campbellton Road in Southside Atlanta. And for those who don't know, this right here happens to be the trenches. No, like the really, really, really trenches, 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 trenches. Like, if you're not from here, what are you doing here? Do not go here type of trenches. And this particular bar is frequented by the Rolling 60s Crips. I'm sick, so good. The disciples know this, but they simply don't care because they've never had problems with the Crips. Well, the night goes by just fine until a group of Crips walk into the bar. Neighborhood, neighborhood. The Crips notice the GDs wearing their uniform jackets and they decide to question them. What are you guys doing in our hood? According to Atlanta police, this led to a major altercation that spilled out into the parking lot. Then the Crips let off some shots into the air and everyone went their separate ways. Thankfully, the night ended with the best case scenario, no injuries for anyone. Regardless, the gangster disciples were not thrilled about what happened on their founder's birthday. And once the governor heard about this, he was really not happy. According to Atlanta police, this is when the gangster disciples declared a beef with the Crips in Georgia. This technically means that there was a green light on any Crips in the state. And that takes us about an hour and a half southeast to the city of Macon. For those of you who don't know, Macon is a small country city that's known for its poverty and also violence. God. For decades, it's been home to a lot of Crips, but in the 2010s, some GDs began popping up. Particularly, Macon was headed by two very important GDs, 38-year-old Virtuis Wall and 27-year-old Derek Taylor, two very wild GD members. Well, it's Friday, December 12th, and the two GDs head to a local bar called the Wings Cafe. This happens to be a known Crip hangout, which is why they chose it. After the beef was declared, they pretty much volunteered to put in work. Well, at 10 p.m., the disciples head to the bar with nothing but nonsense on their mind. They're hoping to catch any Crip member they can find. Now that ain't nifty on 50s. It's Virtuis and Derek in the front and Marquez Patterson and Terrence Foster in the back. The four disciples arrive at the bar at 10.15 and they storm past security and into the club. In the middle of the club, they spot five guys who they recognize as Crips, and this is when they make a move. One of the GDs takes the cigar out of his mouth and throws it at the Crips. Then as a response, a Crip member launches a bottle of hen dog towards Virtui's wall. This is when all chaos breaks loose. Chairs start flying and the bouncers rush everyone out of the bar. The Crips and GDs sprint to their respective cars, grab their blowers, and the Wings Cafe parking lot turns into a truly horrible scene. According to police, two of the victims were Crip members and the other was a bystander. Despite the incident being brazen, police still had no suspects in mind. This is until the police department got a very strange call on December 14th. Hmm, what could this be? For whatever reason, Virtuis ordered Derek Taylor to report his 357 Magnum as stolen and missing. For context, this is the one that Virtuis used at the Wings Cafe. And even though he knew this was a dumb decision, Derek Taylor had no choice but to do it. Hello, this is the Bibb County Sheriff Department. How can I help you? Uh, I'd like to report a missing blower. Okay, sir. Can I have the make, model, and serial number? Uh, yeah, just give me one second. Hey, Virtuis, get over here. Bro, you know the make, model, and serial number? Come on, give me that. Yeah, bro, let me write it down for you real quick. Hello, Miss Officer. I've got it now. It's... Okay, sir, thank you. And do you know when it went missing? Hey, Vertuli, she asked me when it went missing. What do you want me to say? 
Just tell her it went missing before the shooting. Okay, ma'am, it went missing before the sh- <clears throat> It went missing before December 12th. That's all I know. Uh, 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 okay, sir. I'll put that in the system. Thank you. When the department looked up the serial number, they matched it to Vertui's wall. And just like that, he made himself the prime suspect in the Wings Cafe incident. Bro, what? What were you thinking? And after a very short investigation, everyone involved was arrested. In the end, all four gangster disciples were sentenced to life in prison. This was one of the largest cases in Macon history, and unfortunately, it had secondary consequences. Macon Bib commissioners are now looking into revoking the nightclub owner's liquor license. And just like that, the owner lost his business, and the Wings Cafe is now abandoned. In conclusion, the gangster disciples were really causing damage in the streets of Georgia. And sadly, from here, it would only get worse. Now let's head back to Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, hey. For whatever reason, the hate committee decided to go on an awful rampage starting in May of 2015. With Smurf at the helm, the committee was about to turn a formerly quiet suburb into a hood worse than Compton. And that takes us to the small city of Stone Mountain, Georgia. Located about 30 minutes east of Atlanta, Stone Mountain was built as a quiet suburb. It was always known for a beautiful state park and for offering peaceful living outside the city. When I tell you that for decades, Stone Mountain had zero crime, I mean literally it had zero crime. For example, from 2008 to 2014, the city saw one total homicide. But sadly, the streak would quickly end due to the gangster disciples coming to town. Over the course of 2014 and early 2015, the hate committee chose Stone Mountain as their main territory. This is because Smurf lived there and because KK was no longer a factor. He was still a respected GD, but he disassociated from the hate committee. Rumors say that he feared that Smurf was getting out of control and that he changed the direction of the crew. They were supposed to exist in order to discipline members, but Smurf was taking them in a different direction. And once they established in Stone Mountain, he wanted to send a message to the community. The committee's first incident in Stone Mountain doesn't really make sense to me, but I'll explain it anyways. Let me introduce you to a young man named Tori Alston. Tori was an Atlanta Bloods member and was sent to prison in 2014. After serving a year, he was released in early 2015 and he wanted to change his life. He left the hood and decided to parole to his girlfriend's apartment in Stone Mountain. There, he decided to escape from his life in the streets and was there to raise his daughter. He even told his dad, my life is more valuable than this gang stuff. So at the young age of 20, he was truly turning the corner for a better life. Well, somehow the GDs recognized him from their beef in the bluff, and for whatever reason, they wanted him gone. And sadly, on May 13th, 2015, he was found outside of his girlfriend's apartment. No one was initially arrested for the incident as his girlfriend nor his family knew what this was about. Regardless, it shocked the community and was the first of very bad news to come to Stone Mountain. That takes us to July 1st, 2015. It's a Wednesday afternoon in Stone Mountain, and a crew of East Atlanta Bloods are hanging out at an Exxon gas station. They're all standing around a Dodge Charger, listening to music and hollering at girls who pass by. But unlike LA, they're not wearing uniforms, so no one would really know their Bloods. Well, at 7pm, a GD named Quantavius Hurt stops at the gas station to get a snack. While walking to the store, he stops and begins talking to a girl who's standing in front of the Charger. During their conversation, Quantavius accidentally leans on the car. When the East Atlanta Bloods notice they're furious and they decide to approach Quantavius. They began aggressively surrounding him and he puts his hands up to calm it down. He then notices one of the guys grabbing for his waist and that's when he turns around and sprints to his car. As he's pulling off, all he hears is bang. Thankfully though, they pull a Ben Simmons and Quantavius is able to get away safely. After the scary incident, he instantly drives to Smurf's house to inform him. Smurf is furious. Nah, twin. Hey, you tell me. He instantly hands him a ski mask, gloves, and a blower and tells him to drive back to the gas station. He then tells him to do something or else you're making the committee look bad. So at 8.15, Quantavius returns to the gas station hoping the men are still outside. But when he arrives, it's completely empty. So then he figures I might as well go in the store to get the snack I wanted earlier. So he walks in the store and there he sees a random man named DeMarco Franklin. For whatever reason, he thinks that it's one of the guys from earlier, and that's when he makes an irrational decision. Bang. 
Quantavius drives straight to Smurf's house, takes a bath, and throws away his gloves and mask. When Smurf gets home, Quantavius tells him that he caught the guy who targeted him and to check the news. Smurf responded by saying, You did what you were supposed to do. But in the coming days, Quantavius would realize that DeMarco Franklin had nothing to do with the earlier incident. He was just a random guy from the neighborhood who would come in to get a snack. DeMarco had chosen to live in this suburban area in order to give his son a better environment, just to sadly run into this nonsense. Due to the GDs, Stone Mountain was no longer safe, and sadly, more would come just two days later. After the gas station incident, Smurf received news that made him even more angry. He received news that GDs from North Carolina were temporarily setting up shop in Stone Mountain. Particularly, he heard that they were trapping out of the Stone Mountain Inn. For whatever reason, he felt like they were invading his territory without checking in. Now, because the committee was only supposed to be an enforcement crew, the North Carolina GDs had no reason to check in. That's like having a Delta flight and then going to United to check your bags. <laughs> That was a terrible example, forget that, but you know what I'm trying to say. Regardless of the fact that the North Carolina GDs didn't break the rules, Smurf was still upset and he wanted to send a message. July 3rd, 2015, 5 p.m. Smurf and two committee members drive to the Stone Mountain Inn looking for two particular North Carolina GDs. First is a reputed plug named Zay, and second is his right-hand man, E. Thugga. Well, when Smurf and his members arrive at the inn, they spot Zay and E. Thugga posted on the corner. Instantly, committee member Joseph Broxton says, let's hop out and rob them. But Smurf sees a police car across the street and he calls it off. So Smurf drives back to his house and orders the two members to slide back later. These would be three young members named Lil Joe, Island, and Young Drake. Like I said, three young members willing to crash out at any moment. 8 p.m. The trio return to the Stone Mountain Inn and they see Zay and E. Thugga hanging outside with more than 10 people. Now a 3 on 10 attempt is crazy, especially in the South. But regardless, Smurf ordered them to do this and they figure they have no choice. Ooh. They know this is a bad idea, so they actually come up with a second plan. They decide to hop out of the car and approach the Carolina GDs in a respectful manner. Say twin, we're the local GDs, do you mind if we kick it? The Carolina crew is cool with it, and they all decide to hang out and have a good time. That's when Lil Joe asks E Thugga if he can see the trap. Well, E Thugga thinks nothing of it, and the Carolina crew take them to their hotel room. Then boom, out of nowhere, all three committee members whip out. They tell them to hand over everything, but the Carolina GDs are not going for it. Sadly, the committee make a terrible decision. 24-year-old Edward Chadman, also known as E Thugga, would not make it. Committee member Drake was also placed into a coma. Somehow though, Lil Joe and Island were able to get away untouched and they drove back to Smurf's apartment. When the Gangster Disciple organization found out about the incident, they were absolutely pissed. Specifically, Alonzo Walton and OG KK were not happy about what Smurf had going on in Stone Mountain. Smurf knew that he messed up, and for that reason, he needed to find a scapegoat. So essentially, he decided to blame it on all of the GD members who didn't volunteer to go on the recent mission. The idea was that if more members had tagged along, the night would have gone more smoothly. As a result, he put a green light on every GD member in the Stone Mountain area except for Lil Joe, Island, and Quantavius Heard. And as you know, the Chief Enforcer sadly has the power to do this. This was really bad news for Stone Mountain. And that takes us to July 30th, 2015, 1.45 a.m. Lil Joe arrives at Smurf's house in a BMW M5 that he just stole in Atlanta. So Smurf tells Island to get in the car and for the duo to go on some missions. He hands them a bunch of tools and tells them to go out and find any GD members. So the duo head over to Central Drive where they know they can find some members. Central Drive is essentially a street that has a bunch of apartment complexes on both sides. Well at 2am, Lil Joe pulls into the first complex he sees, the Hairston Wood Apartments. As he's driving around the complex, he notices a man sitting in his car blasting music. So Lil Joe stops his car and gets out to approach the man. He aggressively approaches the car with his hand on his waist, and the man in the car notices quickly. So he jumps out of his car and sprints over to his apartment. Sadly, this is when Lil Joe makes an irrational decision. <laughs> Thankfully, the man makes it inside safely, and Lil Joe drives away. After doing this, he quickly drives to a nearby city to lay low. Particularly, he heads up Highway 78 to the suburban Gwinnett County. 
Here they know that they won't find any GDs, so instead they look for easy licks. At 6.15 AM, they run out of gas and stop at the gas station on New Hope Road. So Lil Joe pumps his gas while Islin walks to the store. As he's approaching the store, he notices a red pickup truck that's running with no one inside. So he quickly walks back to Lil Joe to share his idea. The BMW is hot, let's go ahead and take the pickup truck. So the duo walk up to the truck and quickly open the door. There, a man named Oliver Campbell plops up and says, Hey! For whatever reason, this prompts Lil Joe to make a terrible decision. Oliver was simply a hardworking man who was sitting in his truck before work. Sadly, he didn't deserve this in a million years. While directly after doing this, Lil Joe and Ilan drove straight back to Smurf's apartment. Smurf tells them to take a nap and go back outside when they've woken up. The duo get up at 9 p.m., hop in the BMW, and head straight back to Central Drive. At 9.15, they pull into the East Ponce Apartments, the most upscale in the community. They don't know any GDs who live there, but they figure they'll give it a chance. As they're driving around the complex, they notice a man sitting on his patio looking at his phone. For whatever reason, they assume he's a GD, and they both hop out of the car. Sadly, they make a terrible decision. The duo then hop in the BMW and speed away. They then ditch the car behind a building in the nearby Decatur. Well, as it turns out, Rockwell Nelson was not even a Stone Mountain resident, nor was he a GD. He was simply staying at a girl's house that he had just met on a dating app. He had nothing to do with anything. <sighs> Stone Mountain was getting really, really bad. This was number four of the summer, and sadly, another one would come just a couple days later. Smurf got word that a member named Robert Rampage Dixon had stolen money from a fellow committee member. As you would expect, Smurf was furious and he ordered Lil Joe and Island to go get Rampage and take him back to his apartment. So on August 3rd at 5pm, they deliver Rampage at Smurf's doorstep. Smurf meets him in the driveway and simply asks him one question. Twin, tell me the truth. Did you steal? And I guess Rampage's answer was not good enough for Smurf. This was now number 5 of the year for the GDs in Stone Mountain. With a population of 4,000 residents, this gave the city a homicide rate of 125 per 100,000. That's 20 times higher than the city of LA and 5 times higher than the actual city of Atlanta. As a result, the DeKalb County sheriffs were concerned and decided to investigate all of the incidents together. And once the disciples got word that they were under investigation, all of the members either left the Atlanta area or decided to completely lay low. Now you may be wondering, how did they know they were under investigation? Well, that introduces us to a DeKalb County Sheriff named Vancito Gums. Vancito was a respected Army veteran who came back from service with two plans. The first was to follow his father's footsteps and become a DeKalb County Sheriff. And the second, well, that was to join the Gangster Disciples. Well, believe it or not, both of his wishes came true at the same time. The GDs accepted him and he actually became Kevin Clayton's right-hand man. He was truly a full-fledged GD member while being a police officer. And this is why the Atlanta Gangster Disciples were always one step ahead of investigations. Alonzo Walton and OGKK were truly smart leaders and that's why they were never gonna get caught. OGKK was even holding community events and was speaking out against the violence in his community. I done seen I done been around the robberies. I done been around kidnappings and everything that you can imagine. It was back in February when I first introduced you to Kevin Clayton, better known as KK. I told you that once a prominent leader in the Gangsta Disciples, Clayton claimed that he had turned his life around. A lot of these guys do look at you and say, you've been there and you've been in places that they can't even imagine, I imagine. Yeah, I done been there. Like you say, I, I done been on both sides. Like I said, I came up playing football and baseball, athletic side. You know, my mom and dad, they kept me in the sports growing up. But as I got older, I ventured off and started doing my own thing. That's when I got into the and I got into the gang at the gang life. I recruit to go you know what I mean? You recruit to better the community. And, and, and I started the organization reaching out to some of the blood members, the OG Crip members, and the OG GD members that I knew, and we brought it together. I met KK and the BCF crew at Rock of Ages Lutheran Church on Memorial Drive, where young men in his organization serve meals to the homeless every Wednesday. You got a lot of young guys here. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah? That's the best thing. That's the best thing. Why? 
because me being the OG, yeah. they listen. KK knew that the way he was moving and his image were preventing him from ever being investigated. Or at least that's what he thought. But Smurf, on the other hand, well, he was ruining everything for everyone. He and his committee members were moving extremely sloppy, and it was only a matter of time before police figured it out. But in classic Atlanta fashion, police only figured it out once an informant came to the table. In September of 2015, a regional leader named Markel White was caught burning his house down. His idea was to collect the insurance money, but police were all over this. So essentially, Markel White was facing a lot of time in prison unless he gave up some names. Man, I don't want to go to jail, so I'll give you everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. I'll tell you literally everything the GDs have done since the very start. Ooh, you want something juicy? Let me tell you about how the GDs extorted Rick Ross. Ooh, how about how one of your officers is actually a GD? Ooh, how about how that community leader who was on the news is still a criminal? So it pretty much went like that, and that's how the entire Gangster Disciple organization was taken down in Georgia. On April 27, 2016, 48 Gangster Disciples were arrested in Georgia. And the news station that interviewed KK was really not happy. They felt betrayed and were embarrassed of the image that they painted of KK. Well, new at 11, a story you'll see only here. Yesterday's multi-state gang takedown resulted in dozens of arrests, but one in particular caught my attention. Kevin Clayton, he's also known as KK on the streets of DeKalb County. He told me just months ago that he had left the street life behind. A federal indictment, it disagrees. Just one station with the new developments tonight. According to this 55-page indictment, the feds say that KK never left the gang life. They operate in a very complex uh, network. KK is one of 32 people indicted Wednesday in federal court. According to that indictment, these 32 are accused of various racketeering charges, the same gang that KK told me he had left behind. Instead, he claimed to have started BCF, Better Communities and Families. Three years ago, it was all to empower former and current gang members to get on a straight path. As part of the indictment, Britt Johnson with the FBI in Atlanta says that while gangster disciple members like KK were serving the community, they were simultaneously victimizing it. This investigation has shown, shown that members of the gangster disciples who were involved in community-based activities such as feeding the homeless, stop the violence rallies, and community fundraising are simultaneously involved in violent criminal activities. Meaning that the gangster disciples had infiltrated police departments and the parole office. So let me briefly run down everything in the indictment. First, you have the terrible incident in Marietta that kicked everything off in 2011. Then you have the Rick Ross fiasco. However, the Fort Lauderdale incident was never in the indictment. Then you have the gas station music video that went wrong in Westside Atlanta. Then you have Alonzo Walton's nonsense involving the woman's car. Then you have the devastating incident at the Wings Cafe in Macon. Then you have the uncalled for targeting of Tori Alston in Stone Mountain. Then you have everything involving Smurf, Quantavius, Lil Joe, and Island. All of this terrible nonsense in under four years. This just goes to show that Atlanta and its surrounding areas are truly no joke. But on the bright side, the police and district attorneys do their best job to put people away for a long, long time. And in this case, pretty much everyone in the indictment got over 15 years in prison. Even Officer Vancito Gums got 15 hard years. A former DeKalb County police officer convicted of racketeering along with four other members of the Gangster Disciples. Federal prosecutors say Vancito Gums would tip off the gang to police activity. And then he bragged about being a hitman while on the police force. He was arrested after resigning from the department. Law enforcement say that the gang has a long history of recruiting officers to help do their dirty work. Man, man, man. Hopefully this was the end of the GDs in Atlanta, but you really never know. And this is yet another reminder that this kind of life leads to absolutely nothing but terrible negativity. Nothing good ever comes from this kind of life, and if you haven't learned it by now, then you just don't want to hear it. Like while Rick Ross is living happy in his giant mansion, these guys are all living in a 6x9 cell. The guys like OG, KK, and Smurf who used to boss everyone around? Well, those guys are now told when they can eat, when they can sleep, and when they can take a shower. But in my opinion, the worst part about this story is what they did to the city of Stone Mountain. 
After the GDs were taken down, another crew would pop up in the same city. And these guys were pretty wild too, and if you want to see that, go watch my previous video. So if my video hasn't taught you anything, please let it tell you to never move to Stone Mountain. Don't let the suburban and good looks fool you. That place is the trenches. And on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you did, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Also, let me know what kind of video you want to see next. Peace!